Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 226th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Paul Sagany. Paul is the president and founder of Integrated Partners, a hybrid RA headquartered in Waltham, Massachusetts, that manages over $10 billion for about 18,000 affluent clients. What's unique about Paul, though, is how he's generated hyper growth for his firm through building strategic alliances with accountants. Acting as a resource for CPA firms to build out their own financial services divisions, where integrated partners supports behind the scenes, and the CPAs can remain the heroes for their clients throughout the process. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Paul learned early in his career about the power of referrals from professionals with established relationships when Paul was an insurance agent creating estate plans for high net worth clients of wirehouse advisors. How Paul expanded that model and generated initial success by doing financial and estate plans for partners of CPA firms, why it became clear for Paul that he needed to get really clear up front that while the CPA still owned the client relationship, it was Paul's responsibility to actually make and implement the financial planning recommendations, and how client service relationships change when professionals each charge a separate fee for their respective services. We used to talk about the importance Paul places on being product and solution agnostic and having a poor platform where he can remain product and solution agnostic. His key decision in 2016 to re-examine the business model and ultimately form his own RA and how that set the stage for him to change his vision for the firm to gain national reach. And the tremendous growth that Paul is now generating by attracting outside advisory firms who want to tuck into integrated CPA referral program and get themselves in front of higher net worth clients. And be sure to listen to the end, where Paul discusses how moving up the complexity curve by working with wealthier clients helps advisors fight the fear of fee compression as they're able to more consistently charge higher fees for providing advice on more complex needs. Paul's vision for coming years for integrated partners to expand their reach by doubling the number of CPA firms that they partner with, and the who-not-how methodology that Paul has used throughout his career to not only become a better business leader, but find ways to collaborate with others to create synergies. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Paul Sagany. Welcome, Paul Sagany, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Michael, thank you. I appreciate this. I'm a, a big fan of yours and a big fan of your podcast, so I was thrilled when you invited me to join you today. So thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. I, I really appreciate you joining us and, and being willing to share a little about the the advisory business that you have built, you have a, a very large firm of, of many, many billions of dollars under management and, and hundreds, I guess, more than 100 advisors now. And, and I know a pill in a, in a what I think is sort of a, a unique yet not unique yet very unique way of doing a lot of work with alliances with CPAs, which I feel like is, is a realm a lot of us tend to talk about. I mean, I, I've, I've been doing this more than 20 years, and even I heard from the very start, like, build relationships with attorneys and accountants. They are centers of influence or COIs for short, and they can refer you client opportunities. And you, many of us have done that in various ways, but you seem to have kind of scaled that to a whole other level beyond what a lot of advisors typically do in, in the depth of CPA alliances and the kinds of business owner clients that you go after and work with through that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about like what, what it looks like when you try to take that, that level of of CPA relationships, of CPA partnerships, of, of sort of COI referrals to a, a whole other level beyond just, yeah, I met two CPAs in my area and I built a good relationship with them and we sent some clients back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know, it was certainly, Michael, having the vision to back in the day myself. So when I put the firm together back in 1996, I have always been a financial advisor and continue to be an advisor today to clients. And so you know, I remember back in the day, you know, who I guess who would be my sales manager saying the, the best way to grow your business if you want to double your revenue would be to double the number of clients you work with if you work with clients at the same net worth. Or he said you could grow by working with wealthier clients and work with fewer people. And so just going back to the mid 80s, early 90s, that's the path I took, Michael, was really trying to 
work with other centers of influence and, and collaborate with other professionals to get in front of wealthier and wealthier clients. And so that really was the vision we had back in 1996 and all the way through to today. That's what we think about every single day. It's interesting to me how you frame that. So it wasn't just a, right, well, as you said, you know, if I, if I want to double my business, double my clients and twice as many clients, twice as much business. And hey, I could go do that by getting referrals from accountants or CPAs or or from my clients or all the other ways that we that we market and get in business, but that you had the, a vision more in the direction of, I don't just want to grow by doubling my client base. I want to grow by getting more affluent clients, more dollars per client, right? You can you can also double your business by just doubling the revenue that you've already got from your clients and continue to serve those same clients. And that for you, it wasn't just working with CPAs as a pathway for generating leads and generating client opportunities and get more clients in order to grow the business. But that for you is very specifically an, an, an up market, a more affluent client path to say, that's where I want to go because I think I can get more affluent clients there than, than what I'm getting directly on my own. Yeah. You know, there were two pivotal points in my career. So going back to 1990, Michael, prior to that point, I was, you know, doing what I thought was, was, you know, high-end financial planning work. Prior to 1990, also, I was with a company where we would offer disability insurance to attorneys here in the Boston area. So I had the chance to meet a lot of attorneys. And, you know, this was kind of at the beginning stages of second to life insurance. And, you know, even the infant stages of, if you will, offering fee-based financial plans. And so 1990 was a big year because my best friend and, and mentor, business mentor for me, Peter Gaines, he invited me over to become his partner. And he was running a firm called Cigna Financial Advisors. And so from the early 90s, Michael, until 1996, we had the chance that Cigna, Cigna really was a company that was really focused on doing high-end estate planning work for business owners and, and ultra-high net worth individuals. But what was important about that model, Michael, and what I learned from those days was that the bulk of our business was by working inside of wirehouse firms like Morgan Stanley, Smith Barney, Dean Witter. And so for five or six years, the business model was an FA from Morgan Stanley would say, hey, I've got this large client opportunity. Would you come in and do their estate plan? So we'd come in, Michael, do the estate plan, charge a large fee, then would give the assets back to the Morgan Stanley FA. That's when I learned the power of another professional bringing you in the door to a high net worth client. And so that was, say, early 90s to mid-1995, 1996. And the reason why 96, Michael, was a pivotal point, because that's when accounting firms in the state of Massachusetts could get licensed as financial advisors. And so we just saw the opportunity to take what worked so well, say, working in the wirehouse community, take that exact same model and lay it on top of large accounting firms here in New England, and boom, the thing just took off for us. I love that framework that you're know, building this back in the in the 80s and early 90s when you know would dare I say it like when insurance agents were insurance agents and stockbrokers were stockbrokers like we hadn't quite gotten to the point where everybody did everything and was maximally multi-channel and had every possible license and 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 blending it all together the way that we do today that you outright had a business of like writing the insurance as a part of the estate plan with a wirehouse advisor who would bring you in because you did the insurance business and they did the investment business. And that actually meant as, as financial advisors, like you could work together on joint clients. You weren't head to head competition in a way that just, I, I think about that environment today. Like that would never happen today for better or worse. Like we all try to be so holistic for all of our clients that we, you know, we might share with, quote, outside professionals, but we very rarely share with other people who are registered in the industry that we usually view as competition. But that was in, in many ways a, a I guess, a, a more cooperative era and environment in some ways because not everybody was blended. So you really could have you know, joint clients, joint casework with other advisors who had a specialization in a different part of the advisor world because you were deep in insurance with Cigna and they were deep in investments at Dean Witter or, or Merrill or wherever it was they, wherever it was they were at the time. You know, I think, Michael, and it's even true today, it's the recognition that each party brings a different capability to the table. And so where the FA at Morgan may be a great wealth manager, 
we were trained to come in, charge a fee. And, and so once again, you know, I, was, I learned that by charging a fee, I could change the dynamic of the relationship. In other words, I was now there being paid to, to serve the, the client and to take care of their needs. And there was no doubt about the fact that you know, they were paying me a fee to do that. So it was a very different relationship. But I think even today, Michael, and as it is back then, it's, it's two professionals recognizing that we bring different capabilities to the table. And so, boy, if we collaborate and work together, we can do what's best for the client. And doing what's best for the client, certainly it's good for our business model as well. So it's that collaboration, Michael. It's you know, working today with that CPA, bringing our capabilities to the table in that classic one plus one equals three. That's what we're really driving to do every single day. And so the other thing that strikes me about this, just in, in looking at, at, at how it was playing out, you know, one of the, one of the benefits, one of the virtues, one of the opportunities of working jointly with wirehouse advisors in particular was that was, and, and frankly still is, where a lot of the biggest high net worth opportunities are like it just it's literally where the dollars are and so i'm struck as well as you're as you're talking about this that you you were already living in a pathway of one of the best ways to find to find a path to more affluent clients is through other professionals that may have more affluent clients with whom you can work jointly that was already occurring even in that estate planning environment with with wirehouse advisors. Even to take it a step further, not only was the recognition of working, you know, through the wirehouse community to get access to wealthier clients. Cuz you're right, Michael, they certainly did control the hearts and minds of the wealthiest clients out there. But I think it was also the recognition that in what the the FAs in the wirehouse would learn is that, you know, it was hard to call a client of wealth and try to, you know, battle tooth and nail against another advisor who's also managing their money. In other words, even today, it's it's really hard to differentiate your story just by the way you manage money compared to, say, how I manage money. And that's where I learned the power of estate planning, and, and that's what I am teaching all the time and talking to our advisors about. There is no such thing, Michael, as the perfect estate plan. And so, therefore, I think if you talk to any estate planning practitioner, they would tell you there's never been a situation where they sit in front of a client of wealth where they can't bring some level of, of planning improvement or, or make a significant impact in their overall estate plan. When there's a lot of dollars at stake, just sort of mathematically, there, there's a lot of financial impact for a good plan and, and even just one good, you know, one good nugget, one good thing that makes them look at or plan their situation differently. That much money at the stake, lots of difference in the financial outcome for one good strategy. It's huge. And, and I think that people of wealth, their minds are wide open to new and interesting ways to put their estates together or control the way their wealth will go to their children. So even today, you know, this market's been climbing so aggressively that it's, once again, hard to, to come out and, and try to win people over by managing money differently. But if you approach it from the estate planning standpoint, and that's why, Michael, what's about to happen with some of these estate tax changes we're kind of pinching ourselves because yeah. it's going to give us all these opportunities to get back out there and, and be seen as leaders in that space of estate and, and income tax planning. Yeah. Well, and, and I know for advisors that haven't been doing this for a couple of decades may not realize like just how much lower estate tax exemptions were back in the, in the 1990s, you know, the, the estate tax exemption at the time was $600,000. That's right. And, you know, I guess uh, adjust for inflation, that's probably close to a million dollars today. But I mean, a million dollars is I'm sure a lot of people see routinely in their practices. Like if your estate tax exemption was a million dollars, like any, any middle-aged couple who just has term insurance for their kids in case someone dies before the kids go to college has an estate planning problem. Like it was estate planning issues were everywhere because even just standard levels of insurance for protecting against normal risks would create estate planning problems, never mind having like really, really sizable dollars where the, the situation amplifies further. And that was an environment with an estate tax rate that topped out at 55%. So, you know, there was there was a lot of estate planning relative to what there is today, where our exemptions now are 10x bigger and we have portability. Like we didn't have that 
back then. And, and so I can certainly see your, your kind of frame of mind and that mindset. If, if any of the tax law changes that are, are starting to get discussed now around higher estate tax rate, lower estate tax exemptions occur, you know, it, it really rapidly widens the scope of who's got an estate tax problem to, to talk about and to plan for. You know, when you mentioned it, your comment earlier about how many times do we walk into a situation where the life insurance is actually owned in the name of the husband or the wife and, you know, they've got that big house. And so, you know, I think that a lot of times people, especially if they do change the exemptions here, but people do step into that world of having to pay an estate tax just because of the way that sometimes the way they own their insurance or the way they maybe own some of their properties and things like that. So, but I think, Michael, regardless of what happens with the final rules and the final tax changes, I think that as we're telling our advisors is that in our CPA firms to our CPA partners is let's take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of confusion out there today and, and, you know, the lack of step up in basis and lowering exemptions and people being taxed over $400,000. You know, these are things that are in the press every single day. So, we're not waiting for the final tax laws to happen, say, a year or so from now. We're getting out there today, and we're talking to people, doing a lot of what-if analysis, and, and really trying to be seen as the leader, if you will, when it comes to these tax law changes. And so, you know, we're really working hard to position ourselves, once again, in that leadership position and getting communication out there, and so that when change happens, we'll be top of mind for all of our potential clients. So now, help us sort of move forward to the next stage of this story in your evolution. So you're you're working at Cigna Financial Advisors, you're partnering with Wirehouse Advisors on estate planning cases where you get to come in and write the second to die insurance for the estate tax planning wrapped up in an islet. They do the the traditional investment portfolio management business. You've got a nice partnership. They're an entree to higher net worth clients. But then you 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 made some shifts in in 1996, you said like some rules change that CPAs in Massachusetts can now get licensed as advisors. I'm assuming they also just means something something was going on that you decided that doing this as joint work with wirehouse advisors was not your long term future. So, like, what was changing? What led you to make a shift? And and just what what actually changed? What happened at that point? Yeah, great question. So, I think for those of your uh, listeners that are maybe old enough to remember these days, but. You know, when I came into the career, Michael, in 1986, I remember getting a 7 or 8% load, you know, on an American funds uh, A share. And so the early 90s is when the idea of charging 1% to manage money on an ongoing basis was, I don't want to say it was in its infant stages, but certainly there were more people paying attention or more advisors paying attention to that potential business opportunity. So I think Michael, it was two things, a very large case that I had worked on over a number of years. It was a very, very large case in, in really having a relationship with the clients and them begging me to manage their money, but me having to say, well, no, we've got to give it back to the, uh, to the wirehouse FA. That was one thing that I realized that, you know, this wealth management and the idea of charging whatever 1% or whatever it may have been back in the day, you know, certainly had the opportunity to grow a bigger in, in a more efficient business model. And so isn't that great that at the same time for us anyways, that the idea of charging asset-based fees coincided with the, the fact that accounting firms could get licensed to be financial advisors. And, and back then, Michael, we realized that the average CPA that was getting licensed, you know, he or she could, you know, open up a 401k plan or open up a 529. And, you know, they could make some revenue doing that. But the idea of that CPA you know, he or she doing complex planning on their wealthiest clients, you know, that certainly was not going to be the case. And so just like everything in life, having a couple of, you know, interesting connections to some local accounting firms, sitting down and and describing this vision of why don't we partner together and let us handle your top 20% and you can take care of the other ones. That's how the whole thing began. And, And with the first handful of accounting firms, Michael bringing in you know, close to 100 million of assets in the first year and a half. That's what got our attention. And we started growing just by word of mouth. Uh, we'd meet another accounting firm and then another financial advisor would come and join us. And so we kind of built it that way. We weren't really looking to be the largest or certainly grow this thing on a national scale. We were just a local New England, you know, group of people that were trying to to put these partnerships together. So, so help me understand more just what 
what you were doing, what you were building, what you were creating. I mean, a hundred million dollars of of new assets in eighteen months is is a, a large number, even by today's standards. Never mind twenty five years ago. So, like, what did you what did you do? Like, what did you go out and and do beyond saying like, hey, there seem to be some opportunities with CPAs. Let's see if we can get some referrals from them. Like, what did you do that suddenly made all of this money start moving? You know, and I want to be clear, by the way, not every CPA, Michael, as we learned later, has the same level of results in such a short right. period of time. But, but you know, I think back to those days, if it wasn't for that first firm having such tremendous success, you know, we may have walked away from this program because certainly the the third, fourth, and fifth firm were nowhere near as good, say, as the first couple of firms. But but it was the success of the first handful of firms that really got our attention and and made us stay with it, Michael, even during those difficult times when we questioned ourselves and we weren't sure if we were going to keep doing this. We kept saying, yeah, but remember what we did with that firm over there. And you know what it was, Michael? It was pretty simple. We, we went in the door and one of the first things we did was the financial and estate plan on the partners of the accounting firm. And so looking back now, that's kind of our of our routine now is we want to try to do the, the CPA's financial plan as an estate plan pretty early in the relationship. But with this particular firm, Michael, they were a mess. They had a lot of moving parts. They didn't even have a buy-sell agreement. So we went in and did a lot of really complex work for them. And then they just became tremendous fans of what we do. And they literally would grab every client and say, hey, go sit down with those guys. And they'd be walking through the hallways and the the, the main owner of the CPA firm was kind of this very outgoing and, and very charismatic individual. And if he would tell his client, go give those guys 20 minutes of your time, then that people would do that. So certainly, Michael, it was the power of a, of a CPA firm who the partners experienced the planning process and became really disciples of it and started to tell all their clients, get over and see those guys. And that's what really made it take off. There's nothing like having them go through the financial planning process to actually finally really understand the value of the financial planning process that we still often have trouble describing the value of. Huge. It's huge. So, so I'm just curious, though, how, like, how does that work? I mean, do you go to the partners and say, like, "Hey, we'd we'd love to we'd love to give you this service. We'd love to just put you through our financial planning process and show you what it's all about. It, it's you know complimentary to you because we want to get to know you better. But we think you're going to really benefit from the process." Or are you going to them and saying, "Like, no, you know, you you need a financial plan. You don't have one. We charge X dollars for it, but this is going to be really valuable for you." And and you pitch them more directly as become a paying client, we've got great value and expertise for you. And, and then you also know that once they once they go through and do that, they're probably going to end out talking to others about it and referring you as well. Yeah, I, I think that's it, Michael. And I think once they recognize the capabilities that we brought to the table and the fact that, look, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but I think if you were to ask the average CPA of all the financial advisors you know in the world, how many would you trust with your you know highest revenue generating clients? They they usually say a pretty small percentage of us, unfortunately. And so we were just able to bridge that gap. And we were able to give that CPA the confidence to put us in front of their wealthiest clients. But how did you get in front of them to do it in the first place? Like, I mean, are, are you going, are you cold calling CPA partners and saying, I want to do your financial planning? It's $10,000 and you're going to love it? Uh, no, not really. No, we now it's mostly word of mouth and CPAs talking amongst themselves. And I think, Michael, it's it's really about the CPA realizing that they want their clients to be in the best possible situation. So it's, you know, that who do you want to be a hero to? I think that a lot of CPA firms realize right now that just simply doing taxes for their clients, especially their wealthier clients, is not enough. And so what we do is we just simply find who are those CPAs that want to bring us in to help them be more of a hero to their clients. And so, so it's truly bringing together the professional services of the accounting community, financial advisory community, and the legal community, and, and really help put together better plans for their clients. And, and you know, Michael, that lets them grow their franchises and, and their business models, and it gets their clients talking to other clients. And so, so it, once again, if done the right way, it can really grow exponentially. It's got a lot of just huge potential out there. And I'm presuming as well, you know, you said one of the catalysts for you in, in deciding to focus on CPAs was in 1996 was the year that they could start getting licensed as financial advisors on top of being CPAs. So I'm, I'm presuming that means that this wasn't just a, a referrals, cross-referrals program. This was a, 
getting them licensed under your firm, I guess, either as, as brokers or insurance agents or, or IARs of a corporate RA and, and literally doing split cases, split revenue with them. That's right. And it was like pulling teeth to try to get them in the middle of being, you know, a full-time accountant to get that series seven license. And so, but we did it and we persevered. And so, yes, Michael, certainly the offshoot of this whole story is the fact that we're helping accounting firms build and establish what I would call a financial services division of their accounting practice. And so we're just the ones that are coming in to run it, to oversee it and bring the, the capabilities to the table. But But yes, on behalf of our CPA firms, we're helping them literally put together a financial services division, which is there to help with the overall coordination of their clients' financial affairs. And and becomes a revenue opportunity for them because they get to charge for this work or at least revenue share on this work with your firm that may be doing a big chunk of the behind the scenes and planning work, but they're part of the relationship, they're part of the advisory delivery, and so they they get a piece of this as well. They do, and it's... It's substantial. There are a large percent of our accounting firm partners. What we have helped them build is actually worth more than their accounting practice. So, you know, you've got accounting firms now that are selling for right around one times reoccurring revenue, where the wealth advisory firms are selling for north of two, three, four, sometimes five times. And so, yeah, we've been, I don't want to say the word fortunate, but we've worked hard to make sure that in being a good partner and in being a trusted partner, we're respecting the fact that, you know, we're a guest in that CPA's house. And so we act accordingly, but we as a firm are out there trying to help bring more value to the accounting firm as well as our financial advisor. And so the beautiful part of that is, is it's just growing, I think, faster than what other advisors can do inside of accounting firms. We really do respect the fact that it's the accounting firm's client, Michael. We're there to bring a service to the table. We will share revenue with them. But we're helping that accountant build something that he or she could not have done on their own. That's the key part of the story. And I think it's striking, though, that you that you do frame it this way, that you're not trying to take them as 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 your client, the CPA referred it to you, per se. You, you really are framing this as it's about keeping it the accountant's client amount, making the, the accountant look like the hero in this story to their to their clients. And it continues to be their client. But you're supporting, you're doing a lot of the work, you are you are helping to get it done, and, and you are financially remunerated for that. That's part of the, the transaction and how it's structured. That's exactly how it works. And you know, I think if you also were to look at the demographics of a typical accounting firm, they've got an aging client base of small business owners, and the average CPA is not too far off from the average age of a financial advisor, you know, approaching age 60. And so... Yeah, when you put that all together, Michael, and in, in especially bringing the quality planning services to their clientele, it's a fantastic model for us. So when you started down this road 25 years ago, what did the business model look like? Because you're, you're still in, I'm presuming you're still in Cigna. This is still a world where there's a lot of insurance, you know, second to die is on the ride, variable universal life is on the rise. Mutual funds are still mostly A shares and B shares, not not much C shares, not a lot of advisory fee based accounts out there yet. Like, what did the business model look like then? You mentioned they were getting Series Seven license. So I'm presuming like they're coming in to do brokerage, not necessarily advisory, because that wasn't a thing yet. What was the actual joint business that you were that you were doing with them? So in, in 1996, I also I made the jump from Cigna. By the way, Michael. So at that point. Cigna was not prepared for, nor were they really a quote unquote wealth management company. So, so I made the jump to a company called All America Financial. They were a wonderful organization, fantastic people, but they, they had this mentality that, Hey, Paul, if you've got a vision and a dream, we're not going to get in your way. And so, so my days there at All America, they did have a very good wealth management platform, Michael. So, you know, we already brought the expertise to the table for insurance and estate planning they had a very good wealth management platform because their executives who ran that company actually came out of Fidelity. And so they really knew how to put these wealth management platforms together. So no, I I need to give a lot of credit to All America Financial back in the day because they also shared that same passion for getting involved with CPAs. And so it was once again, us finding a firm that shared our vision, that helped bring capabilities to the table. But they left us alone, Michael. So back in those days, there was only a handful of us. There were five or six, maybe seven advisors. And 
And we used to have our meetings in a small little office all the time. But it was just a handful of us, and, and it truly grew by word of mouth. You know, another accountant would reach out, and we would start working with them, and then would bring another advisor in the door. And so I would say, Michael, from 1996 all the way until 2003, which is when we can talk about this, we made the jump to Lincoln Financial, we were just all word of mouth. We had no recruiter. We just a bunch of advisors who were working once again through introductions and, and really growing it that way. But but All America, you know, ceased to exist around 2003, and so at that point, Michael Cigna was bought by Lincoln, which is now called SageMark. So for us, we made the jump from All America in '96 over to Lincoln in 2003, and once again, it's because Lincoln, you know, back in the day and even today, continues to share our passion for estate planning and working with wealthier clients. So, so I don't want to confuse the years here, but 2003 is when we made that jump to Lincoln. So, so you would really like, you, so I guess I'm wrong, but you, you, you came out of Cigna in the 1990s, went to All America. Cigna ended up getting sold to Lincoln. That division got rebranded Sage Mark. And then seven, eight years later, you end up going back to Lincoln Sage Mark to get, to get back to those people to kind of get back to the roots there. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so when you're doing this, joint CPA work back in the in the late 90s and early 2000s. I'm just trying to understand and visualize what this what the business, what this relationship looks like. What do you actually do at that point? Like are you are you making comprehensive financial plans? Are you doing investment business? Are you doing insurance business? Are you doing estate planning cases? Like what did it actually look like at the time? Yes to all three. You know, certainly it was leading with a planning mentality. So we weren't walking in the door with any preconceived notion of, you know, managing your money or doing your life insurance. It was just simply walking in the door, offering to do a fee-based financial plan. And then wherever that financial plan would lead us, Michael, that would be the implementation. And so, but we, we would spend a lot of time really working to kind of clear our brains, if you will, and truly walk into a new client opportunity without any preconceived notion of where I want to take this. Even to this day, we talk about that a lot in our training classes. It's about just flushing your brain, you know, get to know the person you're sitting across from. And once again, let that plan dictate where you're going to go. And so, you know, I think there's a famous line there, Michael, which I learned a million years ago by a gentleman named John Bergstrom, who was one of my mentors and general agents a million years ago. But he said the easiest way to sell life insurance is just meet with people that need to buy life insurance. And so, you know, isn't that a wonderfully simple way of, of increasing insurance sales? And so, you know, we knew if we got in front of business owners, if we got in front of people that high, had high net worths, that the result of a good financial plan, 80% of the time would probably need some liquidity. And that liquidity had to enter at the right time. And so, therefore, life insurance didn't really need to be sold, Michael. It needed to be presented as a solution to a problem. And even today, that's how we work with our life insurance uh, opportunities. It's not selling life insurance. It's looking at the plan and in, in trying to introduce the client to the fact that there are different times where liquidity will be needed. And wouldn't you know it, here's a product that actually does it for you at the right time. And so so that's how we do our life insurance sales. But, but leading with planning, Michael, that was the key from day one. And that was a differentiator for us is that through those 90s and what I had learned in the early 90s was dish get in there, charge the client a fee, and then you had their attention. So once they paid you, you had their attention and they were going to listen and pay attention to what you're doing with them. And so, so planning is the key, the key phrase here to make it work with a CPA firm. And so how did this work in, in how it gets, it's just delivered to the client, like it, it, just in this world where this is still the CPA's client and the CPA is at the center of this, like were you doing all the behind the scenes work for the insurance analysis, investment analyses, and then handing it all to the CPA and they would present it to the client because it was their client? Do you do, you do this as joint work where you go in and the CPA goes in and you meet with the client jointly at, at the CPA's office so it's still on their turf? Like just mechanically, like how did this work? Who does what in a world where you're trying to grow your business? but you're trying to keep the CPA at the center and ha- and keep it as the CPA's client because that, that's what they want for their business. Yeah, great question. I think early on, Michael, the way our model worked is we would go into an accounting firm and 
And the accountant would, he or she would handle, say, the smaller cases. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, those 529 plans or put together a 401k plan. And we were really trying to define ourselves to that top 20 percentile of the CPA's client opportunities. But very quickly, we realized that, you know, the CPA was not a good financial advisor and it would only cause them more frustrations. And so I would say, Mike, very shortly after starting the program, we just stopped all of our accountants from ever acting as a financial advisor. So, you know, from early on, 1997, 98 onward, even through today, our CPAs are not allowed to sell anything, make any recommendations. They are simply there to introduce our financial advisors and our capabilities. Certainly, Michael, if it's a CPA's larger clients and the clients that they, you know, they want to once again be the hero to that client, that CPA will sit in the meetings. They won't make presentations. Certainly at different times, the client will ask their opinion on something and they can give their thoughts and all that. But but it's truly a program, Michael, where the CPA understands that they're there to introduce us. And then we take it from there. We do everything from running the meetings, the client service work that takes place after the fact, the CPA simply just making the introductions. That's an important thing to, to realize is that you, you don't want the CPA getting in the middle of the relationship as it pertains to the financial planning part of the engagement because they, they just get in the way and, and you, know, you don't want them bringing their personal biases to the table. So we want to kind of get them to the side, get them to bless what we're doing, but we handle pretty much everything from that point forward. And so then do you get CPAs that start getting uncomfortable of like, geez, Paul, it seems like you're sort of taking over this client relationship. I thought this was supposed to be my client. No, because it's what I refer to as just really spending the time to be hyper-transparent, Michael, from the very first meeting and explaining what everybody's role is. And so, no, we're certainly, we recognize the fact that we're a guest in that CPA's house and that we're not there to, to wrestle control away from the CPA. In contractually, Michael, we we everyone has a contract in this in this program we put together where the CPA always owns the client, but our advisor will own the revenue that generates from the client. And so we've got this wonderful check and balance where, you know, everybody understands what each other's role is. And and then we put a really well laid out contract, uh, which was put together over many years with with advice and counsel from our CPA partners and from our CPAs. But but everybody's interest is protected, Michael. And you know that's important. Uh, as I knock on wood here, over all this time, we've never really lost a CPA firm, and we really haven't lost any advisors that are part of our CPA program. But you know, but we wanted to make sure if, unfortunately, something did happen, that everybody's interest was protected. The CPAs, our financial advisor, our organization, as well as the client's interest. And so we've done a really good job at, at being very, very transparent as to how we put this together. So talk to us now about how this how this has grown and evolved. So you 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 kind of had a vision for this in 1996. Hey, we're doing well getting referrals from higher net worth clients, but I don't want to only do the insurance business. I want to be broader, which means I probably can't keep doing this with the wirehouse advisors because they're <laughs> doing the same thing. So I'm going to work with CPAs because they're doing none of this. So it's all additive to them. And they've got relationships with with more affluent clients, which are good business opportunities. So you start down this road, you get a a big win with one early CPA firm that sends a lot of business your way. You start putting more into it. You go back to Lincoln Sage Mark to build it further. So like what happens next? How does how does this build and grow? So 2016 was an important year for us. So we were still at Lincoln. And that was around the time there, Michael, where the Obama administration was trying to redefine the fiduciary rule and what was a fiduciary. And there were certainly the thoughts that things would really change in, in our space. So this is the, the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule yeah. and the scope that it may apply. Okay. Exactly right. So and, and that caused us to look closely at our business model in you know, were we gonna be in a position to be successful going forward? And that's when we made the decision, Michael, that we were going to form our own RIA. And so in 2016, we had about three and a half, maybe $3.7 billion of assets. Once again, a small boutique firm here in the New England states. We did grow down into Virginia with some really talented advisors down there. But that was really our footprint. But, you know, I need to give credit to Dan Sullivan, the strategic coach program. And, and it was really being part of that program for so long, Michael, that Dan was able to change my vision and get me to look at what we were doing 
and, and look at it in such a way that we recognize that we could take our success here on the East Coast and we could grow this thing nationally. And so end of 2016, we put our own RIA together, roughly once again, about three and a half to just under $4 billion of total assets. At that point, 2018, Michael, after we kind of got all of our advisors into the new RIA and got everybody settled, 2018 was a pivotal year because that's when we truly decided to take our story national, expanding into CPAs around the country and bringing in advisors from different states. And so sitting here today from 2018 to now 2021, you know, our headquarters now, Michael, are, are here just outside of Boston, as well as our West Coast headquarters are in San Diego. And we've grown this thing from just under $4 billion to now over $10 billion in just a handful of years here. And the exciting part is we don't see the end. We, we're out there talking to a lot of accounting firms, uh, a lot of wonderfully talented advisors. And so we've really set our vision sites very, very high right now. We're, we're kind of catching the accounting community and the advisor community at the right time for our story. And we're certainly very excited about that. So when you made the, the transition in 2016 to to form you on RIA. So I, I, I guess I, I've got a couple of questions about that transition, but, but the first, just like, what were you seeing in the DOL fiduciary role that made you want to make a shift and make a change? Well, I think it was certainly the whole idea of a fiduciary rule, which is acting in the client's best interest. And so we just felt Michael, that we were, had double the responsibility because not only are we responsible for our clients, but we're also responsible for the clients of our accounting firm partners. And so we just felt, Michael, that we had to have more control over the cost, let's say, of using certain investment platforms or our ability to to really take our financial planning to the next level. And so we just felt, once again, the idea of having our own RIA just put us in control of our own destiny. And this is not to knock, you know, our prior company, they're a wonderful company, but we just felt for what we were doing, Michael, and for us to really follow the tenets of that fiduciary rule that if we once again could control our destiny, that would be a much better spot for us to be. So just a, a concern at the end of the day, and it, it just, you know, it's kind of the nature and the reality of being on a broker dealer platform under the BD environment. Like they, at the end of the day, they decide what's, what's on the shelf that you get to use, right? What what investment platforms, what offerings, what funds, what managers. And so it sounds like at the end of the day, just you you wanted your control and ability to to make those decisions, to negotiate those arrangements, to set whatever that pricing is, and and not necessarily have the broker dealer either dictate what it's going to be that you get to use or not use, or or alternatively impact the the pricing of what you get to use or not use. As, you know, if if they're involved and they're overseeing and they're choosing. You know, there there is another hand in the cookie jar, as it were, that can impact the cost of it. And I think, too, Michael, back in those days, if you kind of think back, I think large companies and large broker dealers they weren't quite sure what to do. And so, and this is no knock against what Lincoln was doing; they were certainly do the, doing the best they could possibly do. But but for them to make a change, Michael, to adapt to the changing fiduciary rule, you know, they're moving a giant ship around the ocean, right? Where you know, with our own RIA, we could pivot in a matter of 24 hours. And so no one knew what was going to happen back then. And in, in retrospect, it was probably a lot of what they were talking about never came to be. But but certainly we just felt that our CPA program was growing rapidly. We saw the opportunity to go national at some point with our story and our model. And so we just felt that just having that control and being able to pivot based on what was going on around us would be much more effective. And certainly that's proved to be true. And were you already in an RIA structure with advisory accounts at the time and just under a, a corporate RIA there? Or w- was this all brokerage business that you actually had to like convert and move to advisory in the process of going out and, and hanging your hat as, a, as an independent RIA? Yeah, no, it was a hybrid structure. So it was a corporate RIA with the you know, corporate broker dealer. And I would say back then, Michael, our, our assets are probably 50-50, maybe 60-40, 60% on the corporate RIA and say 40% inside the broker-dealer. But once again, looking forward, we could see that certainly growing our wealth management on the RIA was going to be the way to go. But at that point, it was if it was 60-40, my goodness, I would say today, Michael, it's 
to 4% going in the broker dealer. So we are truly bringing in our new assets and our advisors are certainly investing their clients' asset on the RIA platform versus the broker dealer platform. And so I'm I'm presuming then if if BD business is still a slice of your of your business that you didn't go standalone RA only when you made the transition, you you went to another environment where you could be a hybrid. We did. So we knew we had a lot of legacy assets on the broker dealer channel. And so we, you know, we looked around up there, Michael, and we wanted to find what we thought was the broker dealer that was best prepared for this potential fiduciary rule change. And that's how we came across LPL. I mean, certainly they're the largest out there, and so they're easy to find. But but I had known a number of people inside of LPL for many years, and some good friends were, were part of the LPL story. And so as I did my research and as different team members looked around at other broker dealers, you know, we just felt that LPL had spent a lot of money and they were prepared for potential changes coming ahead. And so quite honestly, that was the number one reason why we chose them over others. Was that you You felt like they were best positioned to handle whatever disruption came from the DOL fiduciary rule? Boy, they invested a lot of money, Michael, to make sure that that on the broker-dealer channel, in, in their corporate RAA, that advisors could certainly check that box of being a fiduciary. And so, yeah, we were very impressed with not only what they had built, but their commitment to even spend more money to abide by the rules. And so, once again, having our own RIA, that was less of a concern with what, say, LPL was doing. But certainly, we were thoroughly impressed with their broker-dealer operations and, and just the people. They've got some wonderful people in there that were easy to deal with, easy to talk with. And so, yeah, that decision was was one that served us well now looking back on it. And so what's your structure under the under the LPL umbrella then? You're, are you using their corporate RAA now or it, it is your own independent RAA and they're only on the broker, they're only on the brokerage side? Yeah, no, we don't use their corporate RAA at all, Michael. So okay. we're a true hybrid. 100% of our RIA assets are sitting on either, you know, LPL, Fidelity, Pershing. We are a multi-custodial RIA story. But once again, to accommodate advisors who join us that have some legacy broker-dealer business, there certainly are some products our advisors use on Lincoln's platform. So, you know, we still have a number of our advisors that are what are called hybrids. But the trend, Michael, is certainly we're, we're helping our advisors, say, move from that hybrid model and get to where they want to be. 100% RIA based. And so we're helping to facilitate that conversion internally. And just if you're already on the LPL platform for the brokerage end, what, what leads you to be multi-custodial on the RIA end? We're also finding advisory practices to purchase on behalf of our advisors. And so by being multi-custodial, you know, if we find another small RIA or another, you know, mid-size RIA that we want to purchase, Michael, we can you know, do it with the least amount of disruption. And so originally we wanted to have a multi-custodial platform so that we could pivot if in fact we did acquire or one of our advisors were to acquire a practice. But now I think it just gives our advisors more choice, Michael. And I think, you know, when you're working with wealthier clients, those clients will bring a different bias to the table. You know, maybe there's one name they don't particularly like so right. much or a name they do like. And so we just want to make sure that once again, we could pivot based on the needs of our, of our financial advisors. So you said in the in the four or five years since you made the transition from Lincoln Sage Mark to LPL and and kind of out into your own independent RA, you've had very rapid growth from four billion to to, to ten billion. Hmm. So help me understand just where that where that growth is coming from. I mean, is that advisory firms you're acquiring? Is that referrals from existing clients? Is this specifically scaling up the the CPA partnership offering, getting more CPAs that are are doing joint work with you. Where's the growth actually coming from at this point? Great question. And I want to give kudos here to Rob Sandrew. He's our, our chief growth growth officer. Rob's just a very talented individual and his his reach, if you will, expands across the entire industry. And so we just give Rob and his team the story to tell. And so, you know, you've heard our story. It's helping advisors grow their practices by working with wealthier clients. And you find those clients via the CPA firms. But I would say, Michael, right now, our recruiting story has changed even over the last, say, 24 months, where now we're attracting small advisory groups, say, between 100 million to, say, you know, $1.5 billion. You know, we're attracting these groups that would like to tuck under, it's called, into our story 
access our capabilities, access the CPA program. So I would say now, you know, Michael, the work that Rob is doing, it's certainly small RIAs, it's small advisory groups, wirehouse advisors looking to jump off to the world of independence and, and continues to be that hybrid advisor, you know, that advisor that has maybe that legacy book on the broker dealer side, but they decide to do more on the RIA channel. So so as we get our story out there, we call it our reach, by the way, but as our reach is expanding and more and more people hear about what we're doing, it's been tremendous for Rob. And so I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he just did an interview a few months ago where our pipeline, uh, Michael, right now is tremendous. And we're finding wonderful opportunities with these small advisory groups and RIAs. And in our CPA program, Michael, right now is about 130-ish accounting firm partnerships. We're now, we've got a plan to expand that to 250. So we call our CPA 250 plan. And so we're now partnering with state societies where we're also running the PEP, the PEP pension plans on behalf of from state CPA societies. And so we're, once again, we're just doing what did so well for us in New England. We're expanding that to a bunch of states around the country. It allows us to tell not only our story, Michael, but you know we can also make the promise that if advisors join us, we can really do our best to get them working with that CPA partnership and then that's going to help them accelerate their growth. And so the story is really tied together very nicely for us. And so it sounds like a big piece of the the growth driver in terms of why advisors come to integrate it and why they work with you is, is, is sort of tying together this. We've got a growth machine in the form of CPA relationships that we've established that we're growing, that we're scaling up, which brings a flow of higher net worth clients in who need planning work, who need to be serviced. So if you're an advisor who's great at service and wants to grow, but isn't quite certain maybe how to make that, how to make that ring come, how to make those new clients come on board, we've got a system and a structure around that. And you have an opportunity to plug in and be part of that growth. And I think two other things that are important, John Pastore and Andre Peterson, who run our CPA program nationally, they've got a line where What's the dog going to do when it catches the car? And so, you know, we also recognize that we're placing advisors, regardless of how big the advisor is, we're placing them into an environment, which is that CPA firm, where they're going to work with clients that are 5, 10, 15, 20 times larger than the type of clients they work with today. So we've also, Michael, invested a ton of dollars into our financial planning departments where we, on behalf of an advisor, we can sit second chair with them. So if they get way over their head, we can sit right next to them and together collectively, we can make sure we bring the right plan to the table at the right time, or we can support the advisor behind the scenes and get he or she ready to go to, to get back into that meeting on their own. But we recognized early on, Michael, that the typical advisor who's joining us, they've got these wonderful, great business models with a lot of assets, but they're not you know, their model maybe isn't appropriate or isn't quite the story that needs to be told when you get in front of those high net worth or ultra high net worth or even business owner clients. And so we do a lot of training, a lot of study groups. And once again, we're there to support the advisors and make sure that when they catch that car, they're going to be okay. And the second part of the story, Michael, which is as exciting, and this is what's really driving our vision in the next five years here, is if you think about the 130 accounting firms, What's actually more impressive than that number is that the average accountant has roughly a thousand clients. And so think about that, Michael. We have access to the tax return information of over a hundred thousand potential clients around the country. And so we have a marketing company which is called InTouch Innovations. It's a company we started about 12 years ago. And so we, Michael, on behalf of our CPAs, on behalf of our financial advisors, you know, we upload all that client information to our marketing databases. And then on behalf of the CP and the financial advisor, we're just trying to deliver that message of financial planning to the right clients at the right time. And so that's going to be our magic story going forward, Michael, as we get this up to 250 accounting firms, you know, 250,000 potential clients. Kind of let your mind wander as far as that goes. But, but we know we're spending all of our time now on just getting our vision straight regarding how we want to market to those clients, making sure that our capabilities are there to support the advisor when he and she gets in front of these wealthier clients. And so if we just keep turning that over and over again, boy, the future is very bright for us. Interesting. So 
So you have a whole marketing team, a whole marketing division whose focus is when a CPA comes on board and says they're going to partner with Integrated and work with you, they actually they, they give you a, a client list of, of contact information, which I guess they can do because they're now jointly registered with you. So you, you're these are functionally shared clients. And then you start running the marketing messaging, essentially the engagement campaigns of, you know, Bob, the CPA is your accountant, but did you know there's all this other planning opportunities and issues? And here's some things that you might want to learn about and know about. And if you want some help with this, we'd be happy to meet with you and Bob together to talk about this. I'm sure your version's more eloquent. <laughs> yeah. That that kind of story and positioning. Yeah, you know, it's that classic Dan Sullivan has taught us over and over again. And he wrote a, a wonderful book, by the way, which I would strongly recommend. And the book is called Who Not How. And so you know, every single time, Michael, that we're faced with an opportunity or maybe even a roadblock to our success, the first thing we ask ourselves is who can solve this problem? You know, not how do we solve it, but who can solve the problem? And so the reason for the marketing company is we recognized early on, Michael, that it was hard for a financial advisor. You know, they're running their own practice and they're doing the best they can to be the best wealth manager that they can. And so they really didn't have the time to also then handle the marketing expertise. And so we just invested a ton of money. We actually built, and even today we have our own proprietary databases, which allow us to do things that can't be done on, say, databases that are offered to the general public. And so, to your point, Michael, under that who, not how, we become that who on behalf of the CPA and the financial advisor, where we will, under their brand, under their look and feel, we'll get that educational information in front of their clients. It's it's always about the problems we solve, Michael. Never, It's never, we can do this for you. It's always, hey, do you have this particular problem that we can help you solve? And so by staying focused on the problems, that does open a lot of opportunities for us. But but once again, with 100,000 potential prospects out there in our CPA firms, we needed to have a story and we needed, ha needed to have a way that we could get the message out on behalf of our financial advisors and our CPAs. And so we certainly take that upon ourselves, Michael, to be the ones to drive that for them. And out of curiosity, just why, why a separate thing? Why a separate? Because it sounds like this is a, like a separate business, a separate offering that 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 you got. Why not just outright under the umbrella of the advisory firm as part of what you're doing? How did how did it come out to be a separate thing? Yeah, and this is the advantage under that who not how is we we had a bit of a challenge. You know, how do you how do you handle an accounting firm's information, which obviously is highly private? How do you handle it the right way? And so we're also blessed, Michael, to have our own attorney here at Integrated Partners. His name is John Cataldo, and he was a former SEC attorney. And so John was able to help us navigate the waters and find a way that we could, without you know getting anybody in trouble, market efficiently to these CPAs' clients. And so one of the most important things, Michael, was never to bring that information into Integrated Partners. In other words, Oh, so you actually do you do keep it separate in in we totally do in touch is there in part because now you can say like the RIA never sees the CPA client private okay. client information nothing we, it's totally a separate company run by her name is Becca Zoffin who interestingly enough was the daughter of our very first accounting firm when she came out of college and she's just amazing and her team is amazing and so once again she becomes that who for our financial advisors and. And it's a separate company, and, and that's how we kind of make sure we're obeying both the privacy laws that the accountants have to, you know, hold themselves to, accountable to, Michael, but also what we do as financial advisors. So making sure we're doing the right thing with this information, it's super important to do that. Interesting. So, so when a CPA comes on board and says they'll be part of the part of this alliance program, they agree they'll use in touch for marketing the service to their clients and and the CPA firm ends out retaining in touch directly to do that so the client information only goes between them and and their marketing firm not between them and your advisory firm but then to the extent that there are client planning opportunities your advisory firm ends up being brought in and actually does the business and then I'm presuming re revenue shares back to the the CPA firm exactly right Exactly right. And it's the classic, Michael, it, you know, we could be the best financial advisors in the world, but if nobody hears about us, then it's not going to work. And so, so that's the job of InTouch Innovations is just get that story out there and keep us top of mind 
you know, as you know, Michael, you know, money comes into motion or something happens in, in a client's life that makes them kind of say, hey, I need to, to talk to a financial advisor. And so the whole goal is to be professional, not be intrusive, but, but let people know we exist. And so when those events happen in their lives, they say, oh, let me reach out to the work that my CPA and integrated partners are, is doing. And so, yeah, InTouch has been a huge part of our success story in making this work for our financial advisors. And so then the CPAs just literally end up under solicitor agreements. Is that the just the actual structure to it? That's the reason we can hold our goal of CPA 250, Michael, because to your point, we now do not have to get these CPAs a Series 7 license anymore. So they can, certainly this is state dependent, but yes, getting a solicitor's agreement, you know, sharing that agreement with the client at the very first meeting, once again, under that hyper-transparency model, explaining what everybody's role is to the client that's how we're now doing it under the solicitor's agreements. Okay. And I guess the, the good news in, in that context is that at, at worst, maybe the CPA has to get a series 65. If they're, mm-hmm. I think if they're, a, if they're a CFP or a PFS, they don't even have to take the exam. They wave into it. Not all states require a series exam for being a solicitor. So state specific, but this gets much less burdensome than let me let me introduce you to the study materials for the Series 7 so we can work together. <laughs> Back in the day, we had a full-time person who would just kind of gently call the CPA every other week and say, you know, get your I work done. Exam going. <laughs> yeah, it would take six months to sometimes a year to, to get a CPA from start to finish, but... But we did it. But you know something, Michael, looking back at those days, that's why we just persevered and we knew we had the time to make this work. And so as we saw our competition get frustrated or they weren't getting the result that they wanted, they would kind of back away. So think about over the last 25 years, I've not only seen local financial advisory firms, but even the largest companies out there try to structure and build a CPA partnership program. And by and large, they just, they lost interest or they got somehow frustrated with us, but we just stayed with it. And we, I always go back to that very first CPA firm and we knew the potential was there. We just had to really work on our, on our capabilities and make sure that we were going to do this the right way. And while others backed away, we stayed with it. And that was the key to our success. And so for advisors who are part of the firm, are they, are they independents? Are they employees, advisors of the firm? Like what's the actual structure of advisors to the firm now? Yeah, no, just the opposite. So a big part of our firm, Michael, is really celebrating that advisor's entrepreneurial spirit. And so these advisors own their own practices. We don't have any employees that are financial advisors internally. And so, you know, they can even keep their own brand and their own look and their own feel. So no, we're we're about celebrating that entrepreneurial spirit of the advisor, but using our size and, and our scope and our vision and our capabilities to to just bring more to the table. And that's really been the key to our story is that we can attract larger groups and these RIAs and these wirehouse advisors because we're going to help them be better entrepreneurs, maybe help them tie into our vision for the future and where they can go with their practice and then give them the people to make it happen. And that's, you know, it's really been the key to our story. And so I just, I've got to ask, so like what, what at the end of the day makes integrated different to be competitive in this space. I mean, as as I'm sure you know, and experience in trying to reach out to advisors to, to affiliate with the, with the platform, you know, everybody air quotes, like everybody says, we have resources and capabilities. We'll help you be a more successful advisor. Look at all these centralized tools and things that we've got. Like what, what actually gets you guys to win the, win the advisor's business on that compared to all the other people out there telling similar-ish kinds of stories? You know, great question. So whenever, Michael, I give, let's say, a talk in front of potential clients or maybe at an industry event or something like that, I always say that, look, it would take you a long time to get to know what Integrated Partners is all about and what our story is. But then I pivot and I say, look, we've got 130 accounting firms, and these are 130 accountants who could work with any financial advisory firm in the world, and yet they chose our story and our model. And so That's the big part there, Michael, is that we've worked so hard in our story to make sure that we are very attractive for that CPA to to want to be part of our model. And then once we have the CPA and we have access to that CPA's clients, it's not that difficult then to introduce that CPA to, say, one of our potential recruits, like an RIA or small advisory group, and say, you know, let's get you all together here. 
But the story for the advisor, I think if you look forward here, I think certainly there's fee compression and and there's the desire of a client of the advisor, the advisory role, I'm sorry, to work with wealthier and wealthier clients because I call it the complexity curve. Once the advisor starts to work with clients that have more complex financial lives, you know, Michael, their fees go up. And those are the kind of clients that aren't going to be under that world of fee compression because they truly value the advice and counsel of a competent advisor in their life. And so, so I think when we help the advisor, Michael, look at their vision for their practice over the next 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, I'm trying to get them to look ahead and realize who are the clients that you serve now that will be somewhat vulnerable in the future to different pricing structures? And then who are the clients that will never be vulnerable to a different pricing structure? And once again, those are those wealthier people with complex financial lives. And so so we're always just telling our story, Michael, and, and looking at the advisor's practice the way it's structured today. You know, certainly, Michael, the advisors who look and join us want to grow. You know, they're probably not at the latter stage of their career. They're at that stage, they want to keep growing their practice and they want to protect the fact that they own it. And although they see their friends out there selling their practices for amazing multiples, you know, they know if they can keep growing this practice. And so imagine, Michael, five or 10 years from now, if your practice consisted of wealthier clients that are tied to your your practice model, plus a CPA firm or two that gives you access to more clients, when that advisor goes to sell that business model, my goodness, that multiple is certainly much larger than a practice that maybe is more exposed to fee compression and clients that may look at different types of ways to get their financial advice. So it's really that combination of we'll help you move up market to more complex and sophisticated clients where you, know, you can generate more revenue per client and the, the fees are less prone to compression because they have complexity in their lives or not getting less complex anytime soon. And we'll, we'll give you a pathway to actually get those more affluent clients because we have all these CPA relationships where we can connect you with CPAs who are going to be referring business in and, and giving you the opportunities to get in front of those clients. And so if you want to if you want to move up market and know how to better serve up market and have a lead generation channel to get the clients that are up market, that's, that's what we bring to you, you know, together at Integrated. Bingo. That's it. Now, you had said earlier that a part of this sort of shift for advisors to move up market is, I think you said like le- learning how to better connect with higher net worth clients, learning how to tell their advisor story better to high net worth clients because it may be different than the, the story and the way that they position themselves in the past. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit further about like what what is that? What is that that you teach or train? What is it that they, they have to learn to, to do and tell that's different than what they do today if they want to serve these clients? Yeah. So the key line there is we don't really make them do anything, Michael. So, you know, an advisor, he or she can join us. And if they like the way they're doing things, we'll certainly support them. But but we do want to make available to the advisor study groups with their peers. And, and you know, I run a lot of the educational events and our Wednesday brunches and our Friday study group meetings. And so we're always to get getting together and talking amongst ourselves. I want to say this carefully, Michael, but when when I meet with a new advisor or a current advisor, I always use the formula, I call it six times 10 plus one. And what that simply means, Michael, is that to go into a typical accounting firm, the goal for an advisor, especially an advisor with a successful practice is try to use that CPA to find six more clients that have 10 times the investable assets of the average client you work with today. So simply put, Michael, if I look at an advisory practice and let's say they average about a million dollars per client of investable assets, well, the CPA program is about getting in front of you know clients that have 10 times that or $10 million of investable assets. So what this means, Michael, is that a lot of times when we look at the advisors who are joining us, and, and I want to say this carefully because I don't want to be unkind, but, but maybe the way they're currently doing their financial planning or wealth management, it, it may not be attractive for a client with, say, 10 or 20 or $30 million of liquid net worth. Sometimes that's hard for the advisor to hear this, but it's, you know, it's really my job to sit down and look at what they're doing and say, look, what works well to manage a million dollars may not quite be the story at $10 million. And so it's really looking at their practice, Michael. And I think also the reason why I think a lot of advisors kind of stumble and, and fall when it comes to charging large fees is that many times they don't feel what they actually offer for financial planning advice is worth a 10 or 20 or $30,000 fee. And so it really becomes our job, Mike, to kind of break that, you know, mold and break their confidence and say, look, 
we've got you. You know, we've got the capabilities. We've we've got the training. We have in-house attorneys and in-house tax specialists, and so we're going to help. If not get you better or, or, you know, help you get better yourself, we'll sit second share with you. But, but over time, as advisors see how we do things, Michael, the beautiful part of working with wealthier clients is that their needs become much more similar than dissimilar. And so, you know, you work with one business owner, the next one will have similar needs and desires. And the same is true with someone with $10 million or $20 million. And so the more we can get them comfortable and confident and get them to maybe make some minor changes to the way they operate, we can get them to the point where a $10 million client will want to work with them. So that's why that six times 10 plus one model is what I'm really out there preaching over and over again. And it's really just getting that advisor to realize, you know something, you can go after that potential client. Last thing I'll share with you, it's amazing that when a new advisor joins us, it's, it always amazes us as to how many, they've got say a hundred, $200 million advisory practice, but but they know a lot of business owners in their personal life or they've got access to people that have $20, $30 million, but they just didn't know how to go after them. You know what I mean? And so, you know, when they join us, it's not only about the CPA connections we can make, but but these advisors have introductions or, or you know, entrees to wealthier people in their communities, and they maybe just didn't have that capability to pull it off. And so that's the other thing that we're doing is just – once again, it's about that confidence word, Michael. It's just giving them the confidence to go after the kind of clients that they dish felt they maybe couldn't get on their own. And then by doing that and helping them get better, it makes them that much more effective inside their CPA firms. So then how do you understand just the math of this and how the and how the dollars split out? CPAs get a piece of this for being the solicitor. The advisor is obviously getting paid on their business. Integrated has to make money for what for what integrated does as a part of the process like i'm i'm assuming this is kind of a lot of just percentage of revenue splits to to various parties but how does this how does this actually work for splitting out the the dollars like who who gets what to make it all add up yeah so i guess in rough numbers obviously it depends on how many advisors or say are working on the case michael sure. or if our team is needed or not but the CPA is going to get somewhere, say, around 30% of any revenue generated. And then the other 70% is split between integrated partners and our financial advisors. And once again, it just depends on how much of our services that advisor needs. But that's how it works in its simplest form is we're, you know, once again, respecting and, and, and acknowledging the fact that the CPA is helping us get in the door. And so for that, you know, roughly around 30% goes to them and the rest is shared between integrated and our financial advisors. And that's why, too, Michael, it's important when you look at this model. It, it doesn't work in our world if an advisor uses the CPA program to get in front of the kind of clients that they already have. In other words, you know, if you're getting in front of million-dollar net worth clients inside of a CPA firm and you can get them on your own and keep 100% of the revenue, you know, then you got to make that volume game kind of work. And just mathematically, like, you know, if, if that program gets you to clients that are 50 to 100%, larger in, in revenue per client or, or even further up from than that, then yeah, you you can you can revenue share 30% of that to the CPA that provided the introduction and you're still going to generate more revenue from that client. You know, Michael, and to come over with the the haymaker off the top here is that keep in mind what that our advisor is helping the CPA firm build, okay, in 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 the success of the program. And so if you also factor in the the case that a lot of our CPAs are in or around that age 60 our advisors will be the ones who will be buying that book of revenue away from the CPA over the next five and 10 years. So the advisor is actually building something, Michael, that at some point in time, contractually, they'll be buying that back from their CPA partner. And so once again, that that ties into respecting the CPA's role, respecting our financial advisor's role, but actually our advisors are building something that at some point they'll have 100% control of. And in terms of how this breaks out between advisors and integrated you've said the you've said this depends on the amount of services the advisor needs is is that a like is that a an overall structure for the advisor that just some are more independent and don't use many of their services and and get higher revenue payouts and and others use more of your back office or centralized services and get less or is this down to like a a case by case level like you you'll You'll get a ninety percent payout on this client, but you know if you have to bring our centralized planning team in, then it's only eighty percent because that's how our centralized planning team gets paid, and you decide case by case what you're going to do. I think to keep it brief, Michael, it's a combination of the two. 
certainly, you know, an advisory group who joins us is giving up a percent of their revenues to be part of our story. And, and I know we've focused a lot of our time on the CPA program and our financial planning expertise, but also internally, we can help the advisors run their practice more efficiently, helping them with their tech stack. And, you know, once again, helping them be a better entrepreneur. That's my responsibility is teaching them how to be a better business owner of their business. So there's a lot of other services above and beyond just the CPA program and the financial planning team. Even, Michael, some of our advisors come in the door and say, hey, will you just help me get space and you take care of it? And so... Although we respect the entrepreneurial nature of the advisor, what I've learned from my Dan Sullivan days, Michael, is that each of these advisory practices are different, and some would love us to offshoot or take over some of the, the things they do every day that, that are big time wasters for them. So using that Dan Sullivan methodology of who, not how, as we get to know the advisor's practice and understand where they're, where they're just not driving forward or what do they have? I call them time sucks. You know, what's causing them to spend too much time on non-revenue producing activities. We've also built an entire internal structure to offload those onto our organization. So, so once again, Michael, it's understanding your practice, what you're looking to do, what part of our services, you know, would be best to help you get to where you want to go. And, and that's, once again, as I always say, that's respecting their entrepreneurial vision. So, each advisor who joins us has their own dreams, their own ambitions. And so it's our job to understand those and then help them get to where they want to go. Dan Sullivan has a great line. He always says that the, the biggest fear of an entrepreneur is they're going to go to their grave, not, not you know, realizing the potential of something they had in the back of their brain. And so I love that because it's my job to get into your brain and tell me what your visions are and where you want to go. And then we'll just put the pieces together under that who, not how methodology and that's how we can really help drive the success of the advisory practices is just understanding what their goals and vision is all about and helping them understand that we've got talent and people that can help them get there. What surprised you the most about trying to build your own advisory business over the past 25, 30 odd years of doing this? That's a great question. What surprised me? The one thing that, maybe not a surprise, Michael, but the one thing I've realized is that with my practice, if I always lead first as an estate planner, so I always call it net rate of return. So I'll, I'll kind of look at their investment portfolio and I'll say, you know, Michael, you're getting 15% on your money. Congratulations. But if half of it's going to go in income tax and the other half's going to go in estate tax, you know, what's the true net? And so I really get, for me anyways, personally, I really want to dig into the estate plan. And I, I talk about net dollars. Do you have enough? We call it, are you okay? And are you going to be okay financially for the rest of your life? And if you're okay, how about your family, your kids and grandkids? And so, so really digging in deep on the estate planning part, getting clients to realize it's about net rate of returns. And I think with this new tax law, potential changes coming down the pike here with loss of step up and basis potentially and higher tax on capital gains, it's just feeding into my story, which is let's talk about your net rate of return. And so that's what's, I don't want to say surprise me, Michael, but certainly maybe the surprise for me is I'm always amazed at how few people of wealth have taken the time and attention to build the right estate plan. So they've got wonderful wealth managers and wonderful advisors in their life, but, but no one's really organized the entire scope of activities and no one's really kind of taken a look at the overall financial and estate plan. And so for me, I don't know if that would be a surprise, Michael, but certainly it's an opportunity that I always look to take advantage of with clients that I meet with. And so between you know, all the clients of the firm, all the advisors of the firm, all the, all the team of the firm, 10 plus billion dollars under advisement, what does a typical week look like for you at this point? Oh boy, uh, it's certainly changed, but you know, I've got amazing people around me, Michael, it, you know, years ago, to kind of jump to when I was 26 or 27 years old, the way I met Dan Sullivan is I was working seven days a week in at six in the morning, going home around seven or eight at night. And that's what I was taught to do. And so I didn't know any different. And then I heard this guy, Dan Sullivan, he spoke at a Boston meeting. He said, you know, he used the ex example of Elton John, Michael. And I think what he said was that, think of Elton John, you know, he doesn't park the cars, doesn't sell the popcorn, doesn't walk you to your seat you know, then sing and perform and then clean the floors after and then, you know, do all the work. He comes in, he performs and he leaves and other people around him are doing all the other ancillary work. And so for me, Michael, that was hit me like a ton of bricks. It, it, it totally changed my life. And it's why I'm so dedicated to his program, because 
I learned that it's all about me focusing on what's most important. And so right now, Michael, for our organization, for me, it's about helping our advisors get better. It's helping to coach them to be better entrepreneurs. So it's taking all of my training for 30 years on being an entrepreneur and sharing that back with them and helping them be better entrepreneurs, helping them be better financial advisors for wealthier clients, getting out there, talking to our CPA partners and letting them know what are the opportunities out there. So I'm just blessed with people, Michael, who can run the day-to-day operations, the compliance, the, you know, make sure the lights are turned on and things are operating as they should. And that allows me to focus on where I can be most impactful. And so like you, Michael, my first love is being a financial advisor. This whole business model kind of built around the fact that I love being an advisor. I love being around advisors and coaching and training and working with them. And so for me, even today, Michael, if I can stay focused on those activities, then we can go some amazing places. And I've got other wonderful people around me that are doing all the other work that needs to be done. So what, what was the low point for you on the journey? I would say certainly when we decided to, to leave Lincoln and do our own RIA, there were some stressful days there and there were some days, you know, was I doing the right thing? And so, you know, there were a lot of advisors and CPAs that were counting on me not to make a mistake and make the right decision. And as you can probably imagine, it's never easy leaving a large firm like that. But, but you know, 99% of our people and our assets came with us. And to this day, I am always so grateful for that. But but that was a difficult time, you know, deciding what was the right thing to do. There were, once again, so many people counting on me not to make a mistake here. But at the end of the day, virtually 100% of our people and assets came with us on this journey. And, and every day I keep that in mind and I make sure that we're meeting their expectations. That's one of my most important goals. That was a difficult time, Michael, but going back to my other comments, but I I had people in my life that I could talk to and, and people that would help to guide me and give me the confidence to make that very important decision. And so... I think when I look at your iceberg diagram and I look at all the, the the things that reside below the water there, Michael, it's for me, it's always my who's. It's who do I go to to talk to? Who gives me the confidence? Who you know? I've got the vision and I've got very a strong hold on my vision, but there are times where I need people just to kind of you know get into my head and, and help me realize what's going on. And so, I think that's why having the right people surrounding you is so so important as you reach those those difficult times, those times that you have below the water there. And so I guess I'm just curious, like who who are those people or who are those roles for you? I mean, is is that confidants, a particular kind of mentor? Is that coaching? Is that study groups? Is that something else? Like just what what do you find actually works for you in finding that network of people that I think as you put like get, help help get in your head and realize what's going on? You know, there's a couple of key people, and thanks for asking that. But but I think back when I was in my 20s, there was a gentleman who you may know, Doug Lennick, who was then a, one of the senior guys at American Express. And, and back in those days, I was actually, I wasn't part of American Express, but I was teaching classes there. And Doug Lennick taught me something, Michael, which I've taught my son, and, and he's now teaching his kids. And that is, the world's about things you can control, things you can influence, and then things you can't control or influence. And so I think early on, Michael, what I learned from Doug was that just stay in my lane where I can control or influence the result and, and stop worrying about things that, that I can't control. And, you know, fortunately, I get the chance to speak to college kids as they're graduating from some of the like, local schools. And it's always the old guy giving the young people some advice. But that's my number one advice giver, Michael, is just don't let the noise get you depressed or, or don't let the noise, the things you can't control, dictate how you think. So... So much credit to Doug Lennick in teaching me to just stay in that lane of control or influence and let everything else just go away. That was so important. And I've mentioned Dan Sullivan so many times, but I'm part of what's called his free zone frontier. And that's kind of a blue ocean strategy, Michael. It's how do we collaborate and, and not look at each other as competition? So that changed my mind entirely where I don't see everyone out there as competition. My mind first says, how can I work together with that person to get the result that we're both looking for? And I give Dan a lot of credit for that. And people like Peter Gaines, who is my mentor and just a wonderful human being in terms of how he works with people. There's an organization called The the One Thing. Gary Keller, the realtor, has something called The One Thing. And a guy named Jeff Woods, who maybe your listeners know, he's always trying to keep people focused once again. Just what's that one thing? And so we as an organization are always trying to take large and multifaceted problems and break it down into that one thing at all times. And so 
knowing Jeff and the work that he's kind of helped me with has really been invaluable as well. So there's a lot of great people. Gino Wickman, who has that EOS system as part of my study group, and Lee Benson, Michael Rayball have a company called Execute to Win. It just goes back to that who, not how. It's recognizing where, once again, we have an opportunity or a roadblock. And so we just find that right person to help us solve the problem. And so these are all names I'm throwing out there that have been wonderful people in my life that have given me direction and leadership at the right time. I think that's what's kind of key is to just have those right people around you. So what advice would you give younger, newer advisors coming in today? Who are, who are trying to get started in today's environment and, and build their path to success? Three things. This is another, this comes from Dean Jackson, who's a wonderful marketing person. It's, it's all about your vision, your capabilities, and your reach. And so just recently, we kind of took the time to study Kylie Jenner and how she became a billionaire. And so if you think about it, Michael, her reach was 100 million people on social media. Her vision was to start a makeup company that she could offer to her 100 million viewers. And so she just found the right capabilities to make that happen. She partnered with a, a makeup firm that could get product out within five days. So I think for young advisors, as I'm out there talking and teaching, it's just make sure you know what your vision's going to be. That's the first thing. So listen to really smart people out there. You did a great podcast recently, Michael, with Tyler Schulte, I think his name was. And yeah. He talked about retirees, and he, if you listen to his podcast, he knows what his vision is. There's no question to that. So I think that young advisors, you got to get that vision and know exactly what it's going to be, and, and then stay on that track. In other words, you've heard me say a couple of times, in the face of maybe looking to make a change away from the CPA program, we stuck with it because that was our vision. And so first and foremost, have a strong vision and help others to help you build that vision. Then get the capabilities around you. Okay, make sure you've got the right talent around you so you can deliver on the promises you offer to people. And then what's your reach? You know, as you're hearing from me, Mike, our reach is those 100,000 people that are clients of our CPA firm. So that's our Kylie Jenner, 100 million people, just as our 100,000. So is your reach going to be social media? Is it going to be referrals from other centers of influence? But I think if, if you're newer advisors or people looking to go a practice, keep those three words on their desk. It's on a yellow three by five card. So every day I read the same thing. My vision, having the capabilities, which is all about who, not how, and then how do we expand our reach? And so I think if you stay focused on those three words, you'll be hugely successful, Michael, because there's nothing but opportunities out there for, for the financial advisory world. So as we wrap up, this is a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just the, the word success means very different things to different people. And, and so you're on this incredible track for building a 10 plus billion advisory firm. And you, know, I think it sounds like looking to, to double it from here as you go to 250 plus CPAs and the advisors to add. So the, the, the business is certainly on, a, on an incredible success track, but I'm wondering, how do you define success for yourself at this point? I think certainly, Michael, it's the combination of family with the business world and you know, a few years ago, I actually built up my 25-year plan. And so, you know, imagine that in the face of a lot of other RIAs and firms of various sizes, you know, building to sell themselves, we're putting something together with a 25-year vision. And so I think for me, Michael's success is, is getting enjoyment out of putting a vision down on paper and then seeing everybody around us get some level of success from that vision. That gives me personal joy and satisfaction. In, it's the kind of joy and satisfaction, Michael, that lets me see out 25 years versus, you know, the next couple of years here. But it's, you know, simple things. It's family. I've got a couple of grandkids, three grandkids now that are just, you know, the love of our lives. And so, you know, tying in family with business, having that vision, watching others succeed around you. You know, Michael, I think all too often this world is about seeing others fail so I can be successful. And that's just terrible. So I think that if we collectively try to help everybody get better, and everybody get the same level of success, whatever that may be, on an individual basis, then the future certainly looks very bright because you do hear much more talk about collaborations and people working together and not so much fighting each other, but how can we, once again, as I said earlier, work together to reach some of these dreams that we all have? Well, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Michael, thank you. This is, once again, I'm a huge fan of yours, a huge fan of your podcast, and so... Dish appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.